Hello, welcome to episode six of Will's Guide. Today I'd like to talk about macros, hygienic scheme macros, and show some real world uses of macros, starting with very, very simple macros and ending up with a more sophisticated macro that changes the interface of the mini Kenrin constraint logic programming language that I've worked on with many people for a long time. We're going to change the interface of mini Kenrin, give it a different interface or extend the interface so you can use it in a new way. So that's what I'm going to try to build up to. There are going to be a fair number of ideas that we have to visit. And if you're not familiar with Scheme, if you're not familiar with functional programming, if you're not familiar with streams or hygienic macros, logic programming, somewhere along this path, you're likely to lose some of the, the details or get, you know, lose the thread a little bit. I'm going to try to explain at a high level my motivation, the problems I'm trying to solve, talk a little bit about the trade-offs and the design, and hopefully you can at least understand that part, even if you don't understand every single technical detail. In the future, I hope to make videos that get into more of the technical details for people who aren't familiar with all these ideas. But right now I want to show you an overview because it's hard to understand why macros are useful or how macros end up interacting with language design if you haven't seen a real example you know, based on real problems. So that's what we're going to try to do today. You know, let me just give you a quick overview of Mini Canron. So Mini Canron is a embedded domain specific language for logic or constraint logic programming, which is also called, we call relational programming, the pure version of it, where you write your programs as mathematical relations, instead of say in functional programming, where you write your programs as mathematical functions. So minikenron.org has information about it. The, there was a book that I wrote with Dan Friedman and Ola Kisilyov in 2005 called The Reason Schemer that really described a, a much earlier version of the language. We made pretty heavy use of what we thought at the time were simple scheme hygienic macros in the book. We didn't think that people were going to have too much trouble with the macros, and we were wrong. Uh, it turns out that the macros confused a lot of people. Scheme macros work very differently than macros and other types of lisps and many languages don't even have the concept of a macro and the scheme or lisp mo notion of a macro is very different than say a c macro so people found this confusing and unfortunately there aren't a lot of good resources for learning scheme style uh, style macro programming so that was that was uh, an eye opener now after that um <laughs> sort of debacle Jason Heeman and Dan Friedman wrote this very nice paper on micro Canron, which is sort of the minimal version of mini Canron. And the cool part of it is, first of all, the implementation is only about 50 lines of code, the core implementation. And the core implementation doesn't use any macros at all. So this is just, you know, sort of pure functional programming, all done in terms of functions. You could also do this with objects, for example, if in an object-oriented language. And a lot of people, you know, I think thousands at this point, have taken this implementation and ported it to a language of their choice. Okay, so there are tons of implementations of MicroCanron. And if you have a, an implementation of MicroCanron in a, a version of Lisp, you can then layer the syntax on top that we're used to in Scheme. And we have an interface called Run, an interface called Run Star, which I'll show you in a few minutes. And so you can layer these macros, and macros are defined using defined syntax, in this case, and syntax rules. Um, these are syntax rules and macros. So you can define macros on top of your core implementation in Scheme, and everything's great. Okay, so that nice implementation of, of micro Canron ended up being the basis for the implementation in the second edition of the Reason Schema, which came out in 2018. So 
by separating the macros from the core implementation made it made things much more accessible to people. However, there is still, I think, um, a missed opportunity here. You know, so still, I think a lot of people are uh, either intimidated by the scheme macros that appear in the implementation, or they just don't understand them. And they, they don't have a good way to learn about them. So um, originally, when in the first edition, we thought that people were going to play around with the interface to Mini Kenrin, with the run and run star. We thought people were going to roll their own interface. They said, okay, well, you know, it's in Scheme. People will just, you know, modify the macros. They'll write their own macros. They'll end up with a totally different interface and different way of interacting with Mini Kenrin. That never happened. It just never happened in 20 years. It just hasn't happened at all. So what I'm going to try to show you is what it looks like to play around with the macros, to write some simple macros, and to write a, a somewhat more complicated macro, still a syntax rules uh, macro that's not that complicated from the standpoint of macros, but it's a little more complicated, and we'll give a new interface to, to Mini Kenrin, just so you can see what that's like, and hopefully you'll be inspired to play around with different interfaces for Mini Kenrin or other languages, or you know, design your own syntax for a language that you're your building, uh, give you a little more confidence there. And if nothing else, maybe we'll show you that some techniques exist that you didn't know about. Either way, I hope you'll learn something. Now, we have to choose a version of Mini Canron to play around with. I could choose faster Mini Canron. I could choose um, one of the you know implementations, the small implementations from one of the editions of the Reason Schemer. All this code is available online. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to sort of keep it more realistic from my standpoint and try to show you, you know, how, how I would actually do this for uh, a more sophisticated implementation of Mini Kenrin called Faster Mini Kenrin that Michael Ballantyne created. And you can find this on Michael Ballantyne's Faster Mini Kenrin repo on GitHub. Okay, so we're going to play around with Faster Mini Kenrin. And so it's a load faster mini Kenrin in scheme. So I'm starting Shea scheme in the mini faster mini Kenrin directory on my laptop. I did a git clone from GitHub. And now I'm going to load a compatibility file that for historical reasons is called MK Vicari. And then I'll load mini Kenrin itself. Okay, so now mini Kenrin is loaded. We have extended the core scheme language and the Shea scheme implementation with new syntax and new functions and you know, uh, basically a new embedded domain specific language for logic programming. And there are a few, few operations there. So let's, uh, let's see, we've got equal equal. That's part of mini Canron. You can see that's represented as a procedure in scheme. Um, we have something called Condi. You can see I get an exception if I just type in Condi in valid syntax. So that tells you that Condi is syntax. This is a macro. We've ex you know, expanded the syntactic representation or the syntax of scheme. There's another thing called fresh. You can see that's also a macro. There's something called run, also a macro. Run star, also a macro. There's some other parts of faster mini Canron, but I'm not going to talk about those right now. These are the, the things that are important. Okay, so we have this equal, equal, fresh, condi. Okay, so these are the, what I'll call the logical operators. Okay, these are logical operators. And then we also have run um, and run star. And these are what I'll call the interface operators. So Scheme doesn't have a notion of logic programming built in. Instead, we've you know, added special syntax using macros uh, for fresh and condi and um, defined a function called equal equal. And we've also, in addition to having those logical operators that implement logic programming, we've had to 
create an interface between Scheme and this logic language that we've defined. And that's the job of run or run star. Those are the interface operators. So their job is to translate between the logic programming world and between the scheme world. All right, so let's see if we can uh, show a very simple example of a mini Canon program. All right, here's a very simple mini Canon program. So we have an interface operator run, and we're asking for one answer if there, there is an answer. Q is the name of our query variable. And then the actual query that we're asking is whether or not Q is equal to five, or a better way to say it is, if Q and five were to be equal, what would the value of Q be? Okay. Now, not surprisingly, the value of Q would have to be five. All right, so very simple query. We can extend this query a little bit, make it more sophisticated using what's called a cond, which syntactically is based on Lisp's cond operator from John McCarthy. And so this allows us to do a choice. So now we can say we have two choices. We can ask in our query um, about Q and five being the same, or we can ask about Q and six being the same. So one way to look at this would be to say, for what value of Q is it true that Q and five are the same? That's one answer we could get back. Independently of that, we could ask the query, for which value of Q is it true that Q and six are the same? And because we're only asking for one answer, when I run this, we get back five. So when Q is five, then Q and five are the same. That's one way you could, you could look at it. I can ask for a second answer, and now I get back six. These answers are independent of each other. I could ask for a third answer. Oh, I still get back the first two answers because there are only two choices here. I could add more condi clauses if I wanted more answers, but that's, that's it. And if I ask for a run 100, same thing. Now, instead of typing a number explicitly, I could also type run star, which is a different macro. It's actually different syntax. And that means give me everything. So instead of saying, just give me the first answer or the second answer, just give me all the answers until there are no more. Let's run star. So these are our two interface operators, run and run star. Now there's a whole lot I could show you about mini Canron and there are ways to get infinitely many answers back and there are ways to get infinite loops and all sorts of fun behavior. I'm gonna to try to keep it very simple. Uh, I will show you just one example. This is a, a traditional example in logic programming and to use append. So let's just define our version of append. By tradition, we call it appendo. And uh, if you've seen, say, prolog, you've seen something like this almost certainly. Uh, this is our version in Mini Canron. So we're gonna say if L is the empty list, then S and LS are the same. Don't worry about exactly how this works. I'll talk about that later. I just want to have an example that we can play with. If L is, well, let's do it this way, uh, A cons on to D, then LS is going to be A cons on to res, and we're going to make a recursive call of, um, Let's see, D to S to res. Okay. All right, and now I can do my run interface and I can um, say, well, let's go ahead and append some things. So let's uh, append the list A, B, C to the list D, E to get the list I'm representing as the query variable Q. We get the list A, B, C, D, E. And the interesting part of this style of programming is that instead of saying we want to append ABC to get DE, we can say we want the result of appending ABC DE to be the list ABC DE, and maybe we don't know the list in the middle. So now we're going to append the list ABC to the list Q to get ABC DE. Well, what do we get? We get the list DE. 
in, we can have more fun. So I could say maybe you have two lists, X and Y, and I want to append those lists X and Y to get A, B, C, D, E. What are all the possible ways that could be done? Well, turns out that we've got multiple pairs of, of lists corresponding to X and Y that if we were to append or concatenate these pairs of lists together, we get A, B, C, D, E. Okay, so this is the relational part of the programming. We can treat append O as a relation, a three-place relation, and we can put logic variables, what they're called, or query variables in different positions and have the underlying logic engine fill in or try to fill in the values for those variables. Okay, this is a very rich paradigm. I have a lot to say about it, but I really want to focus on the macro part. So let's just say that, you know, that's enough mini Cameron for now, you know enough. So let's go ahead and talk about some of the problems that come up when you have an embedded domain specific language like mini Cameron that exists in what's called a host language. Scheme is the host language. So we have two languages. We have scheme, which is the general purpose multi-paradigm language, and we have embedded in it this mini Kenrin language for logic, and we have an interface between the two, which is run or run star. And the reason we need an interface is that the scheme system actually doesn't know anything about logic programming, logic variables, or query variables. All of the apparatus that I'm showing you, all, all of these, um, you know, things like run, run star, these are actually, you know, expanding into just regular scheme code. There's nothing really magic here. It's all scheme code in the end. Um, but the macros let us make it look like we're um, in, a, in a different language that's not scheme. So if I expand this code, this run star code, we can see what this actually turns into, which is a lot of code. Okay, that's quite a bit of code. Um, this code is hard to read partly because it has what are called generated symbols or gen sims. Um, and we'll get into in another video why those are necessary in scheme macros and why they aren't necessary in other types of macro systems. But, you know, they're there. In Shea Scheme, we can turn off the printing of those. We're not getting rid of these special gen sims or generated symbols, but we're you know, saying don't display those when we print it out. So. Let's expand the macro again. <clears throat> okay, the run star. All right, so this is what that run star and call to appendo actually expands to, you know, without looking at the funny, funny names for the gensims. So we can see we have a, a call to this function take. We've got the first argument to take is hash f, which is false in scheme. We've got this lambda that creates an anonymous procedure representing a function. And then we've got a let binding and a whole bunch of other stuff. Okay, it's kind of complicated. You don't have to know what it does. It just does a bunch of stuff. What this is really doing at a high level <clears throat> is creating a stream of answers. A stream is a way to represent an infinite list of answers. Just like you might represent a list. You know, what if the list could be infinite? What if you could have infinitely many answers like all of the integers? Okay, they keep going forever. So streams are a way to package up representations of infinite numbers of things or potentially infinite collections of things, infinite lists of things. And the take function's job is to try to, what we call pull on the stream and try to keep grabbing values from the beginning of this potentially infinite <clears throat> list-like structure and accumulate all those answers into a list that eventually gets returned. We'll see it has a slightly different interface. If instead of doing a run star, I did a run two, let's say, and I wanted two answers and I expanded the code, you'd see that instead of taking this hash f argument saying, effectively give me everything, instead take is gonna take two. Take two elements, if possible, out of the stream 
And the stream you can think of as a delayed computation. So we've we got all this work to do to do this, this uh, potentially complicated query. And we want to be really lazy about it. We don't want to do any of the computation until absolutely necessary, especially since the computation could result in infinitely many answers. So there's no way we could return them all at once. Or producing one answer actually might go in an infinite loop. It's That's a possibility in Mini Canron. So we want to be lazy about it and not take any more than we need to. So that's why we have run star versus run with a number after it, which we call run in. Okay, so here with a run two, you know, just give me two answers or just one answer with a run one. If I say run six, we'll get all the answers. And if I do a run 100, we'll get the six answers that were produced, which are equivalent to the run star answers. All right, so that's the basics of the mini Canron interface and the interface the scheme. Now let's think about some problems that we might run into if we're playing around with a system like mini Canron, an embedded domain specific language. <clears throat> well, one problem, which it's not really mini Canron specific at all, not even a, a domain specific language exa um, example, is that we might want to test our code. Okay, so maybe I'm going to be doing things like changing the implementation of mini Canron or changing the implementation of Appendo, you know, rewriting Appendo. Um, and, you know, this isn't really specific to logic programming. So I might, might want the ability to write some tests and I might want to say, oh, okay, so I know that when I call appendo x, y, a, b, c, d, e with a run star that I should get back this particular list, okay? So I could say, well, let's imagine we have some sort of test function and maybe it takes two things. Maybe it takes that expression that we want to run and it also takes the answer that we expect. Okay, I'll quote this list. So we've got the, uh, the six answers. All right, so whenever we do this run star, we should get back these six answers. And maybe I also wanna give a name to the test. I'll call it appendo A, B, C, D, E, maybe. All right, so now we've got the design of a little test function that takes a name and it takes an expression and it takes uh, another expression that's just a quoted list. So just immediately evaluate to a value. All right, now I haven't defined test. So let's go ahead and define test. Let's start with defining test as a function, just a regular procedure in scheme. So we could say it takes a name, it takes the test value and it takes the expected value. Okay, so those are names for our three arguments to the test. So we got the name, the expected value, sorry, sorry, the uh, test value and the expected value. Now notice here, before I was talking about expressions and now down here um, in the names, I'm using the word value. And that's because scheme, like most programming languages, is what's called a call by value language. So if test is a procedure, the evaluation rules of scheme mean you take the arguments to that procedure and you evaluate them to get a value. So whatever the value of run star is, we're actually gonna run the run star, get back a list, hopefully, if it doesn't give us an error or an infinite loop. We're gonna evaluate this quoted expression and scheme, a quoted expression just gives you back that value. Quote of datum is datum. And then we're just gonna compare the two. Okay, so, the, so these expressions will turn into values and that's what we compare. So let's add a conditional. So if, can test for equality, if equal test value and expected value, if those are the same, then, I don't know, let's just return past. Okay, we could print something instead, there are all sorts of things we could do. All right, we'll just return the symbol past. Otherwise, let's signal an error and so error in test. And in fact, 
I, I might want to use name here, error and name. Well, but let's just say error in the test. And now what we'll do is we'll create a format string. And the format string will contain information um, here. So we can say test, okay, uh, let's say name. Every time I write a tilde s inside this format string, that tilde s will be replaced with the value of the corresponding argument. Test s failed. All right, and then let's write some more. Um, failed producing uh, um, I don't know, got <laughs> value tilde s instead of expected value tilde s. And I'll put in a new line there. All right, so basically we're saying the test value and the expected value differed, and we want to print all those out along with the name of the test. Okay, so that is a test function. And so we, let's go back and try our test again. And our test passed, okay? Now, let's imagine that we changed Dependo or changed Minicanrin or something, and now the behavior is a little different. You know, I'll, I'll fake it to make it um, not pass anymore. All right, now we've got an error exception in test. The test Dependo ABCDE failed, got the value whatever instead of the expected value whatever. Okay. So a little test function. Great, no problem. However, you know, now we just have to look up the, the test by the name. If we have lots of tests, that's kind of annoying. It's kind of annoying to have to give a name to a test. Maybe instead, I would like to see the expression that evaluated to this value that didn't match what we expected. So I wanna see the actual expression in particular, in this case, I want to see the run star x, y, appendo, blah, blah, blah. Okay, that, I'd like to see that expression as part of my, my error message. So we could look at our test, test uh, function again, and there's a problem. The problem is because scheme is a call by value language and test is a function or procedure, we actually don't get the expression passed in to the function. We get the value of the expression. So that that run star in our test, uh, this run star is already evaluated and has already produced the list by the time we get into the body of this procedure. By the time the body of the procedure gets evaluated. It's too late. The expression is gone. We just get the value of the expression. Well, that's kind of annoying, but this is an example of where we could use a macro. So instead of defining test as a procedure or as a function, we can define, I don't know, let's call it new test. I'll keep the old one around for comparison. In new test, uh, we're not going to define using Lambda, we're gonna define well, first of all, we're not gonna define using define, we're gonna use define syntax. Okay, define syntax, new test. So we're building new syntax, adding new syntax to scheme. In this case, we have a very simple macro. We'll get away with syntax rules, which is a simple pattern matching uh, language. And I'm gonna use square, square brackets, doesn't matter. This underscore is just the name of the macro, that's a convention. Okay, so that really is uh, refers to a use of the name new new test, and we want to keep the same the same interface here, more or less. So we're still going to have a name, but the difference is this is no longer a test value. We're going to say this is a test expression, um, and expected value is expected expression. Okay, so now we're dealing with expressions instead of their evaluated versions, which are the values. So I can still uh, do my conditional. Let's start off with a very simple version of this macro that it's not very, you know, basically you, you won't see much difference. So let's just change um, 
Every time you see value, let's just replace that with expression. Whoops. Uh, uh, okay, it's a little too eager. I should have replaced hyphen value. Okay. Anyway, uh, so here is our new macro. So if we call our macro new, new hyphen test and it's given three arguments, name, test expression, and expected expression, then what gets produced is actually new code. Our macro is a little compiler and the expression, the, the call to new test will be rewritten and turn into this if expression, okay? Now, if we use the macro, we shouldn't see a whole lot of difference. So let me find a use of the test. All right, I'm gonna go pick it up here, I guess. Uh, here's the test. Okay, so the old test we didn't change. We still get the same behavior. So let's call new test now. And it should behave the same. Yep, same behavior, okay. So we're still looking at the values. We still haven't printed out the expression. But one thing's already different. Because this is a macro, we can call expand on it. So let's grab this, quote, okay. And we can see that the macro expands to this additional code. So all of this code, all of this, is what that macro turns into. Okay, so this is like a little compiler. We've written a compiler without having to invoke any sort of external tooling. The compiler facility is built into Scheme. Now let's change our macro a little bit. So let's go back to our macro here. And let's take advantage of the fact that we have access to the expression, not you know, and which is what we wanted, right? So we didn't want to just print out the value of the expression, we wanted to print the expression itself. Well, format is a function. So if we're calling format in the context of this called error inside this if, the test expression is actually going to get evaluated and will turn into a value. So we still are getting the value instead of the expression that's uh, printed out with our, or uh, put into our format string. So we're gonna use a, a technique here of quoting the expression. So in Scheme, if you quote anything, any sort of expression, the expression doesn't get evaluated. If you quote some datum, like a list, instead of that list representing a function call, a procedure application or special syntax, that list just is treated as a list, you just get back the list if you, uh, that's the sort of thing that we get. So the test expression, um, which was originally, let's see, where is my test expression? So much expansion. So originally our test expression was this run star thing, which is special syntax. But as soon as there's a quote in front of this whole list, then that expression is not treated as something to be evaluated, but instead you just get back the list, literally the list that begins run star. Um, in fact, I can try to show that real quick. So here's the behavior of run star being evaluated. And here's what happens if I put a quote in front of the run star. I just get back the run star expression as, as a list now and I can manipulate as a list. So I can, I can say, give me the first part of the list. And sure enough, I get the symbol run star. So I can quote, um, quote any expression, quote any datum, and I just get back the datum instead of evaluating that as an expression. So what that means is I can go into my macro and in addition to having test expression and expected expression, I can put a quote in front of test expression that will keep test expression from being evaluated there. And I can say, I can change my message a little bit. I can say expression tilde s um, has value tilde s instead of expected value tilde s. So I just added more 
um, add another tilde s so to correspond with the, the arguments. But the important thing here is that I've quoted the test expression and I also have an unquoted test expression that will evaluate to a value. So I'll be able to see both the expression and the value. So let's try using that version of a uh, new test. I'll do it without expanding it. So here's our new test, let's try it. Okay, so let's look at our, our new message. Test appendo a, B, C, D, e failed expression run star x, y, blah, blah, blah has value. Now it's a little hard to read, so let's change our macro a little more. Let's put some new lines. Um, between the parts of the error message, just to make it a little easy to read. Okay, let's try that. Exception and test. Test appendo a, b, c, d, e failed expression run star x, y appendo x, y quote a, b, c, d, e has value, and then here's the list we get back, instead of expected value, whatever. Okay, so you can see now we can get not just the value of that run star, but we could also see the run star expression itself in our test macro. Okay, that's nice. So that's something we can do with a macro that we couldn't do in a, with a function. Now, we could package up, you know, there, there, there are ways we could try to get around this problem, but if we just want to do it directly, just be able to have the, you know, the, the actual expression appear in the output or the um, the, the string passed to error, uh, we're gonna have to do a macro in Scheme, okay? So that's the, the technique we can use. So that is a very simple problem that a macro will let us solve. And, and uh, this macro is a, a very loose version of something Oleg Kisoyov had created for an earlier version of Canron. Okay, so that's a very simple version. Let me show you another very simple macro. And let me describe a problem that we have. So like I said, mini Canron is an embedded domain specific language and Scheme doesn't know anything about mini Canron. So Scheme has things like define, which gives a name to a value. So we can say X is plus three, four. Okay. And now if I look at X, okay, it's seven, no problem. And Scheme has Lambda which produces procedures, let's say times yy. Okay, so this lambda expression will evaluate to a procedure that takes one argument and attempts to square that argument. Great. Um, I can apply that procedure immediately, give it, I don't know, uh, how about I give it uh, one plus two, and then you know, we get back nine. Great. And Often we'll combine these two things, uh, define and lambda, to define a function. If we want to have, a, have the name for a function, like I can say define square to be lambda y times y, y. And now I have a more convenient way of referring to the square function. I can say let's square 1 plus 2. Great, 9. So we have define, we have lambda. Lambda has an interesting feature, which is the body of lambda, the part you know after the uh, where the the variables come in. You know the body is right here. The body can contain more than one um, expression or more than one part. Um, so, for example, I could say one thirty seven. And then times yy. That's legal. So I could write that down. And I can do the same with my named version. So I can say we have 137. And then multiply y by y. And so if I do my squaring, behaves identically. Now, why would you want this behavior? What does this mean? Well, implicitly... There's something in Scheme called begin, begin, which allows you to sequence expressions. And the value of a begin is the value of the last expression in the begin. Okay, so the value of that of the begin would be whatever y times y is. And this 137 
you know, you're not going to see the value. You won't see the value 137 anywhere. Well, why do you want that? You want that because maybe you want some sort of effect or side effect. Maybe you want to print out, hello. Okay. So maybe you want to do something like print or debit a bank account or move a robot and then return a value. So begin allows you to have this capability. So if I call square, in addition to returning nine, I also get the side effect of hello being printed out. So uh, that's what begin does. Now, Lambda has what's called an implicit begin in it. Okay, so if I write this expression, even though you don't see a begin, there is actually a begin there in the lambda. Okay, it behaves the same. So if I call square, same thing happens. All right, so why am I telling you this? The reason I'm telling you this is that there turned out to be a very common error that people would make when using mini Canron in the first edition of the book. And the, the problem was something like this. If you remember, we did define append, and then we did something like lambda, lambda ls ls, and then here we had a con d, and blah, blah, blah. Well, maybe someone's defining a simpler relation. Okay, I'll say my simple relation and instead of all that, they've got x, y, and z. And originally, they have something really simple. It's just they're unifying x with maybe the list containing y and z. That's, that's all the relation is, okay? And this works just fine. So I can say run star q my simple relation three, four, Q. Uh, and that failed. Why that fail? Uh, okay, how about Q three, four? Okay, that works. So, okay, <laughs> let me see. What did I do wrong? <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, all right. Okay, this is good. This is a little of an aside, but this is, you know, uh, let's just try to figure this out. So uh, what's going on here is this would be equivalent to writing three, four, Q, okay. And of course the list and three are not gonna be the same. So that's gonna feel, I just, I just came up with an example off the top of my head and I got it backwards. All right, so anyway, we have a simple relation and it works in mini Cameron, that's fine. Maybe we want to make the relation a little more complicated. Maybe we want, you know, Z to be five now. And so we write something like this and we try running again and it fails, okay. Um, maybe I introduce a new uh, variable about a and B, and I put in B there. Okay, so now it works. Um, so I can play around various games here, but the problem is I've introduced an error in my program. And this is an error that, unless you know Mini Canon pretty well, and even if you do know Mini Canon pretty well, you just might miss it. Uh, you might you might not see this problem. So the problem is, like I said, there's an implicit begin here. Mini Canron, uh, you know, the scheme doesn't know about Mini Canron. So in this particular case, this is going to be equivalent to a begin of these two calls to equal equal. The first one will be tried to see if there's any side effects like printing. And then the value will be discarded. And then only the last expression within the begin or within the body of the lambda will be returned. So it turns out that actually that's the only thing that's going to happen 
in this computation. And the first uh, call to equal equal will be entirely ignored. And if you're trying to debug the behavior of your program, this will drive you up a wall, I guarantee it. Because you'll be looking at code and you say, I know what equal equal does. And I can see that my code has this equal equal, but for some reason, I'm not seeing a value associated with X. I'm only seeing a value associated with, with Z. Why is that? Well, the reason is because this isn't being used by Mini Cameron. It's being ignored. So the proper way to write this would be with a fresh. So instead, in Mini Cameron, what you should do is write a fresh of no arguments with no variables, of what we call a fresh nil, and wrap these two calls the equal equal within the fresh. Okay, and now there's only a single expression in the body of the lambda, or the begin, and everything works works well. So I'm gonna try it again, try running it. Okay, so now you can see we're actually getting something back um, in the A position, whereas before we didn't. Before we had this underscore zero, which represents uh, A remaining unassociated. Okay, so it doesn't really matter about the details of Mini Canron. There's probably, unless you know Mini Canron already, you're probably gonna be missing some of this. But the point is, there's a rather subtle error, a syntactic error, where instead of writing this, someone accidentally forgets the fresh and they write this. So that's the problem. They forgot the fresh. And this usually happens when they started off with a simpler program that only required one use of a, a mini Kenrin expression and they added another one and they just forgot the fresh. Okay, so one thing we could do to try to help out the, the people using mini Kenrin is to say, well, look, in mini Kenrin, you don't actually use Lambda. Uh, especially. You're not doing what's called higher order programming normally in Mini Canron. Um, and, you know, the, the defined and lambda being separate and not having the fresh, yeah, that's, that's uh, a way for people to get into trouble, it turns out. You know, people also um, make mistakes with the lambdas. So we can invent some new syntax, and you can see something like this in the second edition of Reason Schemer. Let's define some new syntax. We'll call it define relation. It's called defrel in the second edition of the Reason Schemer, but it's a similar idea. So let's define a little macro. This is a really simple macro. And the idea is if we're defining a relation that's called R, um, the R will take a list of zero or more variables and it will take a list of one or more goals, and these dot, dot, dot things mean zero or more occurrences of whatever comes before them. And now we can turn this into an expression, which is a define expression, define R to be lambda x dot, 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 fresh of no arguments, g, G, whoops, uh, I was trying to be a little fancy. G star dot, dot, dot. Uh, okay, what did I do? Oh, <laughs> define syntax, okay. So I, I need to use define syntax instead of define. All right, there we go. Uh, nope. All right, what did I do? Missing ellipsis for, oh. Okay, I typed too many dots. It should be three dots. There we go. All right. So now, if I go back to my simple relation, um, which here's the, the broken version, instead I could say define relation, my simple relation. I don't need the lambda anymore. Instead, I just put the list of arguments up here, and then I can have those two equal equals, now I have to teach Emacs how to properly indent this, but all right, so now I can define a relation. And so if I call a run star with my simple relation, 
it works. So you can see that we're getting a value associated with A and with B. And if I expand this use of the macro, we can see what's going on. So we're going to create this global name called my set really, uh, sorry, my simple relation. And it's going to expand into, you know, this is going to be the, the equivalent to having a Lambda XYZ, a procedure of three arguments. And then this Lambda ST that stands for state and this Lambda nil, um, this is internal mini Canron stuff. So we expand it all the way into mini Canron internals. Um, but you can also see that we have this equal equal list YZ and this equal equal uh, ZY. There's some, some other stuff going on here with uh, bind and scope and so forth. Doesn't really matter. The point is we've been able to package up the define, the lambda, and the fresh into new syntax that is both more convenient and also protects us from making this error of first starting off with a very simple relation that has exactly one mini Canron expression, and then over time adding another expression, thinking that it's gonna be in a sequence or a conjunction or an and, but we forgot the fresh and it turns out everything except for the last one's ignored. So it protects us against that um, problem. So we're, we're building up some abstractions here, syntactic abstractions um, that will allow us to, you know, sort of make our language higher level in a way. All right, so these are, are simple macros. Um, they're solving relatively simple problems, but I can tell you this this latest problem drove people up the wall, you know, and, and also uh, I still occasionally get caught by this problem of, you know, having multiple mini Kenner expressions without a fresh, you know, that, you could spend hours debugging that because you know you think the code is right there. Um, so this is a nice piece of syntax. It's easy to write the macro. You know this was not even if what it uh, expands to is a little complicated. You can see the macro itself is pretty simple. The main thing you have to know is that these dot dot dots mean zero or more occurrences of these patterns. In the next video. I would like to show you a more sophisticated macro, still simple in terms of the macro um, itself, in terms of the syntax rules use, but uh, that does something more complicated to redefine the interface for run. So here, define relation allows us to redefine uh, the interface for defining many Canron relations instead of you know exposing define and and uh, lambda from scheme. We are now, you know, writing something in a mini Canron syntax that's specific to mini Canron. Uh, so we've redefined the syntax or, or abstracted the syntax for defining relations. Next time we'll come up with a, an alternative interface for the actual query itself that will allow us to do some things that run in and run star don't allow us to do. Okay, till next time. Thank you.